Welcome to Weekend Walkabout, where we're in our gardens and yours virtually, this week talking about basic indoor gardening. We're coming to you from GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Stephen. I'm Janet. <coughs> That's where Stephen would like to be most days. Oh. And once in a while, I do go out with him. I get her in a boat, but can't, that's about it. <laughs> can't call me a fisher person. And our daughter, Sonia Nicola, is with us, thank goodness, uh, moderating the chat, helping with technical questions. She's a professor at the University of Toronto, which is why she knows so well how all of this works and can help anyone with any questions that they have. Uh, but she's also a, a lifelong gardener, a uh, poor kid. She had no choice. And <laughs> she has a big indoor garden. Um, this is, is this Trogdor, Sonia? Uh, that is Trogdor, our first Christmas tree when we couldn't get our own Christmas tree our first year together. Yeah, yeah, so the poor Dracena <laughs> got uh, loaded down with it's ornaments on it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and Jane and, and with us today too. Well, well, we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a back, back story here because indoor gardening is something that we talk about a lot, but has not, um, have not for a number of years been very active in ourselves. Once upon a time, and most of you will not even recognize who this person is because I certainly didn't when I came home from work and he opened the door and let me in the house. I had no idea who this person was. For a Halloween party one year, Steve decided to shave his beard and I had never seen him without a beard and I would never want to see him without a beard again. But this was the only picture that we could find of our wonderful monkey puzzle tree. Oh, it was a great Tree. which finally had to I had to go because it got so big and it was so dangerous and sharp that people were running into it um, that was the year that he was Tinkerbell and I was Peter Pan at a Halloween party um, but those plants they 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 do grow on you um, they get bigger and bigger and taking them in and out of the house bringing in the rosemary and me taking out the jade gets to be a bit of a chore and when you've got 30 or 40 plants um, those of you who have plants and move them in and out of the house, every, you know that that gets to be a chore. So we began to appreciate the little plants. And when we moved to the house that we're in currently six, year, six years ago, um, we, I, I left plants because this house has very deep overhang, they're very deep mm -hmm. eaves, a lot of trees all on the south side, not much north window exposure at all. I said, I can't, I can't subject plants to that until we started talking again about plants and, and, uh, and we went out and now I have a little garden. So there is a, a note-taking guide for today. It's, it's on, our web, on our website under the webinars and tab and audience materials, or if you look in the chat, you'll find that there's a link there to get that guide so that you can follow the basic notes that we're, we're gonna cover. But there is also a, a supplement this time, an additional piece that has a lot of links to additional articles that if you were interested in those particular points, there's more about them. And we'll show you how that works later. Um, oh, I guess I'll show you how it works now that oh. additional points. If you find that you wanted to know more about buying lights, if you click the link, it'll take you to an article we've already written on our website. And many of those articles, those of you who use the website know that many of those articles are there in magazine fashion because we did write for many years a magazine where we sent you a magazine once a week of 10 pages or so and so those are there as a you can click on that button and it won't download it right away but you can flip through it and read it and decide if you want to take it down take it onto your own computer so you can look at those things and, and uh, once you click the pdf to open it you can read more about it and with us today sorry for the delay there is shane pliska He's the president of Plantera, which is a company that we um, have seen for, well, it was 26 years ago that I talked to, to the, the founder of Plantera, and it was already well established then, so we'll let Shane tell you how long it's been around, but they um, install and maintain interior gardens all over the Southeast Michigan area. And uh, I think they've done some work even beyond with the things like this living wall that Shane is, is uh, poking at here. It's one of his favorite walls. He was telling me when he took the picture. Uh, they are experts at growing plants in places where people need greenery, mm -hmm. but maybe it's not the ideal place to grow it. And he's gonna help us today. We're gonna start out with an interview and, uh, and then take a look at some of those major points in indoor gardening and see what we can learn from there. It's a beautiful place, Plantera, with great diversity of plants all growing together. Look at those ferns and succulents all growing together in a vertical surface where the water is dripped down the backside 
so that things like succulents get the right amount of water even next to things that need it, it dry. flows evenly somehow pretty wonderful um plantera is a, it's a beautiful place uh, all new greenhouses conservatories compared to what i first met there um and big enough that they can do events there so they have weddings and things in their big uh entrance area but little plants big plants their working areas are stuffed with plants, especially this time of year, Steve and Shane were saying, because the Christmas ornaments are coming in. Uh, but they have a workstation where people are cleaning up plants, repotting things. It, it is an everyday indoor garden uh, for Shane all the time. So he's a great person for, um, for you to talk to. And we're going to start with asking him the question of, tell us about what it was like, Shane. You must have grown up in gardens or something to be as involved in it as you are. So tell us about tell us about Shane and your connection with indoor gardening and interior plants. Sure. Uh, well, well, first of all, good morning, good morning. <laughs> and um, it, it is an honor to to be on here, Janet. And it was such a nice time to walk around with Steve just a couple of days ago, um, in in our facility. Um, so this is uh, almost our fiftieth year in business. Um, wow. So so twenty six years ago when you were here, you're meeting with uh, my dad. Um, and and he is he is happily retired um, at this point. And um, if if this uh, if this webinar was in the evening, uh, he probably would have joined. <laughs> but he's not much of a morning person. And that's a prerogative of the of the retired person. And and Shane, not to not to um, say that I. Uh, but when I met your dad, he was uh, he was already retired. He was loving it. It wasn't like he was at work. It was like he was in the place he'd always wanted to be. <laughs> but yeah, that's very true. And about 10 years ago, when we went to a, we built a new facility on the same property because the previous greenhouses, um, we just couldn't maintain them any longer. They had um, character. <laughs> they, they, they did. In fact, we have a tetrastigma vine that we transplanted here. And a structural engineer at the time told us that the tetrastigma vine was holding up the old the, the previous greenhouse <laughs> yeah yeah that's truly roots in gardening so you grew up in this in this business and and it's still yes i did it is it is a beautiful thing um let's bring me back to control yep. steve there you go um can you can you put any fingers for us on what you think is the most important aspect of indoor gardening uh growing things inside is it light is it soil is it the air is it the Water. It is, it is by by far light. Light, uh, light, um, light dictates everything when it comes to um, sustaining as well as growing plants indoors. Um, and and so uh, as as we know, photosynthesis is how plants produce their food. Um, and we also know that uh, light indoors is a lot less than light outdoors, um, especially in the winter. Um, so um, the key to every, to sustaining or growing, and there's a difference between the two, um, an indoor plant um, is to make sure that there's enough adequate light. Um, and if there isn't, um, either to uh, mo you know change the way you would take care of it or add in supplemental light. Okay. So is that one of the things that you look at when you're asked to install a garden for, say, a corporate um, or hospital yes. or... Yeah, yeah, that is the very first thing that we have to evaluate, and and unfortunately, it's a very misunderstood subject, um, even among very highly paid architects and designers, um, because there is a um, th there's a conflict um, be be between how much light a plant needs versus how much light is needed for um, just to to sustain code. Uh, versus uh, what they want for um, energy code too. So a, a lot of the uh, elements that are in windows that reduce the amount of light in the commercial building um, are designed to reduce the air conditioning um, bill and the air conditioning needs, which means that reduces the amount of light. light or the heat gain specifically. Now there's new technology, there's new windows that have a higher level of transmission of usable light without the heat gain, which is positive, um, but it does, it, it's not always used all that well. Although recently there's a big trend in workplaces where light is actually a big deal 
And so I'm just so thrilled because it's this idea, there's a professor at University of Michigan, and he told me, he said, light should be like the canary in the coal mine um, for, for the workplace. So if, 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 if you can't sustain a plant with those light levels, it's not good for humans either. That's great. That's to a know. great point. That's very good. Yeah. No, I, I'm really sensitive to dark. I, uh, I go, I go down as the light levels go yes. down. So that's that's great to hear. So you actually are, are working with people then, not just on selection of plants, but sometimes you have to work with them on on their on their lighting situation entirely. Okay. So light, we'll we'll uh, we'll focus on light a lot. What about? Um, okay, these are in order here. What about how long you can keep something in a pot inside? Um, you might be surprised to hear this, but I mean, we have uh, client sites where we've had plants in the same pots for 30 to 40 years. Okay. All right. Yeah. And what, so, what is it? What long is, time. So, so they, they do grow though. I think the jade on the left, which is in your greenhouse, I think I, I met that jade or some like it in your old greenhouse 26 years ago. Um, you, 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 you probably did. <laughs> and it looks like it's trying to bust out of the pot. Um, what's the criteria for when it's time to move something into a bigger pot? Well, um, a, a jade or, or this jade, you know, jades are, are different than other plants because they, they store their, their water, their moisture in their foliage and in their trunks. And they have a, 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 they don't really require a, a huge root system. Um, so it, it is very much a different animal. So we actually treated jade similar to how a bonsai would be treated. Um, and so, um, and also because this jade is inside our conservatory where it, it, there's plenty of humidity, um, we're not all that concerned about, um, about the, the aspect of it drying out just because it is a succulent. So in this case, we don't mind a jade plant being root bound at all in a, in a tight pot. I, I've uh actually found some people getting their jades into trouble by up potting them. Yes. I remember one time telling, telling somebody, do you still have the old pot? Let's get it out of this new pot. You put it in and put, because there's so much moist soil around the edges of its roots that it's, it's actually shrumping up. It's getting wrinkled and it's anyway. Yes, uh, that's right. A jade does not want to have wet feet and um, it does not want to be in a, in a big sea of, 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 of moist soil at all. So it's actually very happy. Um, especially when you, the pot that's in this photograph here, you know, that, that is a, uh, you know, that is a, a stoneware terracotta style pot. Um, so that is, uh, pro that is the best type of pot for a jade plant in particular. Because it breathes, because the terracotta yes. lets air come in and out. Yeah. And it's got some weight too. I said that, that jade's got to have some weight to it and could tip over a lighter weight pot, couldn't it? Yes, so that, that is, uh, that's actually one of the more frequent issues that happen with people that have big collector jades is they become top heavy and they fall over. And yeah. big collector dracenas, and we have a neighbor that's got the dracena um, in a pot with a brick on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of things to keep it, keep it in, in one yep, place. Yeah, just like a bonsai, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we, we know that people will ask because they, they ask us all the time, how can they avoid pests like mealybugs. Um, is there some way to avoid them or is there some surefire way to stop things from deforming the leaves and stunting the growth on plants and making a mess in the house with stickiness? And So the, the, the answer is, is that it really is a, it, it is all about cleanliness and, and keeping things clean and even, and even more clean. And, and so unfortunately what happens is, is most often a, a mealybug is introduced because um, you brought in a plant from a nursery that had a mealybug on it, okay? Um, and at first you don't notice it because you know, they're so small. And then by the time you notice it, there's, there's a population that's, that's thriving. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so there's a few tips that, that, that I would recommend. Um, so one is, is, is first try to isolate the issue. So if you know that you have one particular plant that is infested, quarantine it from the rest of the plants in your house, okay? Um, and quarantine, it means put it in a separate place, but also don't touch it and go touch other plants right away. I mean, just it's the one right, yeah, yeah, wear yeah. a mask. Well, <laughs> <laughs> all, almost, almost. Um, <laughs> I, I, yes, there can, you can spread press uh, by utilizing the same equipment or same rags, things like that. So you want to make sure that from, from that perspective, you're not spreading around 
um, pests to other plants in your home. But the first thing is, is, is to quarantine it and then evaluate what you need to do. What, what I like to do is um, I, you know, if, if you see pests on it, I, and it's, let's say it's a winter time, it's around now, throw it in your shower and hose it down really good. That's the very first thing to do is, is, is to try to wash off as much as possible. Um, then uh, you take a rag with rubbing alcohol um, and try to get into all the nooks and crannies of, of where those mealybugs would be hiding. So yeah, they do like those little axles where the branches meet, don't they? They sure do. It's like these little, you know, these little spots and you just try to, you just try to clean them off and, and just kind of find them. Now there's also mealybug and I don't want to freak people out that can be in the soil too. And that's a different situation. It almost looks like grains of rice. Um, but we're talking about the mealybug that's on the foliage. So it's very important to, um, to wash the plant and, um, and essentially wipe it down. Okay. Um, clean, clean, clean. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and, and so, you know, if, if there's different bugs that are attracted to other things, but the new growth they're very much attracted to. So mm -hmm. when you get new growth, always take a look at it be, and, and watch it carefully. Okay, so Grandma Jenny, Grandma Jenny with her uh, dusting rag, who was constantly dusting the plants, was harking back to Victorian times and cleaning leaves mm, all cleaning the time, leaves. right? Yeah, yeah. She she sure. You didn't put and, much you know, even, at least she yeah, didn't even a spray it. bottle with, uh, you know, with, with, with water um, and, and a little bit of diluted, you know, just a little bit of rubbing alcohol sometimes can be helpful too, um, in terms of just kind of keeping them at bay. Okay, Great. clean isolating, quarantine, favorite plants. Have you got any favorite plants that you, uh, that you like to work because they are really reliable and, and, uh, and, and are they available? I, 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 I have. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, right now availability is tricky for almost about everything. Um, but from a, a reliability standpoint, my, my favorite plant is the ZZ plant. I like the ZZ plant too. We have um, that, that I, I had never heard of that before about, 10 years ago, and now I see them all over. They're, we only have a picture toward the end of the presentation. I can't get to it right now. But. And, and so they've, they've only been introduced about 20 years ago or so, um, and they quickly became very popular as, as, a, as a workhorse type of plant for the interior plant trade. But you know what? I, I see them in, in retail all the time, in independent you know, nurseries, as well as even places like Ikea. Um, it, it is absolutely um, a bulletproof plant. Um, that's easy to take care of. Um, and, you know, the leaves always have a nice um, appearance and it's very a drought tolerant plant, which I particularly like. It strikes me as a plant, as, as a, a, a visual cross between a fern and a jade. Shiny, almost succulent leaves, and then that fern-like appearance of the, the branches arching up. I, and I agree with you within, within a design, as, uh, from a design perspective, yes, absolutely. Um, and also since it has the round shapes like the jade leaves and feng shui, um, you know, those round leaves are associated with prosperity because they're shaped like coins. I did not think of that. <laughs> from the <show>. Okay. <laughs> um, but the, 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 uh, the ZZ is actually, a, a, almost, it's a bulb. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bulb based plant and it has a very large bulb under the soil. But it doesn't. It doesn't go dormant, though. No, no. It is. It is um, a tropical um, or or semi-arid. It could even be because it's because it stores that kind of water in it, um, and so it does not go go dormant. Okay, um, we'll we'll come back to those in, in a bit here um, because. The low, the low light zz good in low zz i've seen in i've seen zz in north facing uh entryways lobbies that didn't seem to be getting any direct light so i suppose it's good for low light are there any other good low light plants that that you work with where people need sure to so um so we like to use the term tolerant of low light because there isn't really such thing as a low light plant necessarily um but we call it in the trade it's it's called low it is called low light but but essentially all plants do need light Okay, I just want to, because sometimes some folks think low light means no light. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, so the, from, a, from the, lo, the most low tolerant plants, uh, low light tolerant plants, those are gonna be in the, in the Dracaena varieties, okay? Um, those are gonna be the broader, um, darker green colored leaves. So they're talking about like an Aspidistra, uh, which is known as the cast iron plant, almost has an almost green black 
kind of it look does, to it. Yeah. So the deeper the foliage, typically, the more uh, low light tolerant they are. Um, also, the spathophyllum um, would be a good example of that as well. The spathophyllum peace lily? Yes, exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, so and look, for, look for really dark leaves and probably the shiny ones. These wouldn't be fuzzy or succulent. Right, right. No, no yeah, yeah. No, no, no succulents that I'm aware of are tolerant of low light at all. Yeah. Okay. And, and what about the other thing that people like inside, which is flowers? What's your, what's your best uh, blooming plant suggestions? You know what? Um, I, I personally really like the, uh, the anthurium um, because it is, it is the gift that just keeps on giving. It just and that's the, uh, I, I, I call it kind of the Hawaiian plant. That's another one we have a picture of a little bit later with a very shiny, waxy, uh, glossy yes. leaf and the little tongue that sticks out of the colored uh, colored leaf on the top. It, yes, it, it actually the anthurium has a. Um, a they they also have a you know either a, typically a, a red, yellow, or or a white flower, um, very waxy in appearance. Um, and so at at my home, I can get them to rebloom um, a couple times a year actually. Um, and and so it's just um, it's just and, and the foliage is also very attractive. So that's the other part that I really like about the anthurium itself. When you say you um, could get them to rebloom, what is it that uh, what is it that you're you're providing for that plant that's causing it to rebloom, or or what are you what tricks are you using? You know what I that's what I like it. I I don't really use any tricks. Um, okay. my, my, uh, I, I would say that I'm just very fortunate that I that I have a lot of light where I am. Um, so light will trigger um, light light cycles do typically trigger blooms the most. Um, so the other one, and you have a picture right here, would be the, the bromeliad, uh, which is an all-time indoor plant favorite. Um, so, so that, so that would that's known as a silver vase uh, or an achima fasciata. Um, and so there's hundreds of different types of bromeliads out there. And for the and and for people who are really passionate about indoor gardening, um, there's a bromeliad society. Um, yes. There are. Um, you know, you, you mean, and, and they reproduce in terms of producing pups, so they're kind of fun that way. Um, and the blooms last almost three months in, in, in some cases. So uh, the, the Hema fasciata that you have there, that this that your picture is at, at its peak of, of its bloom cycle, or just past peak. Um, but, um, but they're very exciting. Yeah. I, I've met a couple of people who are into bromeliads in the same way that outdoor gardeners get into hostas or daylilies, and they have 50 or 60 or 70 kinds of them all over the place. Uh, it, is, it is an interesting group of plants. Okay, bromeliads and the uh, anthuriums. Right, and then if you, if, if you have higher light, you know, I, I'd say, you know, like Hoyas and lipstick plants, really, you know, they're fun. I mean, they have a really nice bright bloom. Um, I see a photographs of African, uh, you know, violets, violets here. That's not something that we deal with at Plantera just because it's, it's not something that we're able to, to be successful with in a commercial setting. It's typically too small for commercial space. Yeah. Um, yes. They are teeny. But and they and also then, need and, to be cleaned up constantly. Constantly yeah, got to take petals. Yeah. They do. So it's just not ideal for, for our, our, for the commercial side of what we do, but I, but I know they're very popular. And, and of course, you know, orchids, um, you know, I, I kind of saved orchids for last. And, I, and it's kind of funny that it's not my favorite. It's probably because we probably because growing up. It's like, I'm, you know, it's orchids out of the ears all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are they, are they one of your holiday decorations orchids? They get moved in for special occasions. Um, so orchids are in, in, in our business, they're, they're utilized year round. Um, and, um, you know, what, what can I say, you know, no one ever tires of, of a white orchid, um, in, in, in America, um, in, in Asia, white orchids mean something else. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it is going, going between cultures is, is interesting. The yellow marigolds in, uh, in India, for instance. Maybe. Yes, that's right. So yeah. some of our clients are, um, you know, Japanese uh, uh, car makers, and uh, there's a rule that we that we have where we are not allowed to put white orchids in in their spaces. Right. So 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 they'll get pur purple orchids instead. 
Thanks. It's yeah. good to know. Yes. Very good to know. See, those are little things you have to know about your yeah. clients. Um, is there a best time or a good time? Your workstation, it looks like, is, is busy all the time, up potting, repotting, cleaning plants up. But is there a best time to be doing this kind of work where you're splitting and dividing things? Well, um, I mean, I mean, first, be, you know, be intentional about why you want to split or divide them. Um, of course, you know, real horticulturalists get really excited about uh, about you know sharing their babies and such with other folks, <laughs> and I and I know that's lots of fun. Um, and and so if, if 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 the intent is 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 to share the wealth, so to speak, um, I I would say it's about when when you have time. Um, but um, you know. If, if, if you really want, so what I'm trying to say is that there isn't, I'm not saying there's a horrible time to ever do it, uh, but the best time to do it is when the days start to get longer. Um, so like in March or so, so, so the plant ends up getting more energy, more light, so it can replenish its root system. Okay. Yeah. As it comes into growth then. Um, right. you, I, about half the world identifies themselves as gardeners. Um, and so here you are putting all of these plants out there where chances are 50-50 that the plant's going to be near a gardener who probably can't bear the thought of not touching or doing things to the plant. And the other half maybe treats them like furniture. Can you tell us what some of the worst things and best things that people do to, you, to your plants that are out there? Um. So we, uh, we prefer that, that only our people touch our plants. <laughs> <laughs> For um, sure. <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, we've had situations where, where, where we've had individuals, uh, you know, take a stock, you know, for, to propagate on their own. Um, and this is happening more often than not and because plants have become more popular um, in the last five years or so. Um, unfortunately, in some public spaces where we have six inch plants on display, there's actually we've had some theft out there, you know, downright uh -huh. where people actually just take take some plants. So that would be the worst. Um, you know, look, if, if someone wants to, you know, clean off a mealybug, they're certainly welcome to. <laughs> but not about emptying their coffee or their soft drink into the pot regularly or. Uh, right. Yeah, food. that's that's stuff that that can cause problems. Probably the worst is, is that we're in a hospitality setting like a hotel or casino. Um, and, and, uh, alcohol is not good. Um, and, it's um, not. Oh, darn. <laughs> and, and, and definitely we have what's known, sadly enough, uh, we have what's known as biohazards. Um, this typically only happens on, on casino properties, um, where it's, uh, you know, a bodily fluid of some kind that ends up in a planter. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a lot of, um, you know, cleaning is what I have to say. Our business is a lot of cleaning. In, uh, yeah, yes. in, in a uh, large installation at a hospital or at a, uh, a casino, do you have a technician kind of there all the time? Um, depending on the size of the facility, yes. Um, so like uh, for, 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 a, for a large installation, about every other day, we'll have a, a horticultural technician. Um, and so they may not, they're not watering every single plant every day, but they are um, going through um, a cycle of, of, of maintenance, of, of, of cleaning and, and watering. It's a combination of the two and grooming um, to make sure that the plants aesthetically look good consistently. That's truly a big indoor garden that some people are taking care yeah. of for you there. Yeah. Um, so Shane, there are some questions that I've seen in chat already for you. Can you stay with us for a while? And Absolutely, yeah. Okay, Sonia, do you oh, have that, anything that, uh, that I hope Shane has time. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take the ugly picture off and go on to yeah. uh, um, good, good plan. that's a little prettier. There we go. All right. So one of the first questions uh, that uh, I think we'd like to ask Shane is from Amy about whether Plantera will ever have public uh, events or access again. There's an event there about 10 years ago. She says she attended. It was fantastic. You know, we'll see all the plants and creative installations, plant, some plants and pots and other items for sale. So she's curious about when we can get back in there and if. Um, so we, uh, it, yeah, as, as she accurately said, um, we no longer are... Um, offer retail. Um, but one of the things that we would like to do um, as, as the pandemic ends is start to offer some public events that are specifically you know, plant related. Um, so I, I would encourage you just to follow us on social media and see when those are. 
Um, we used to, until the pandemic hit, we would do a concert about once a year with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra that was open to the public in our space. Um, and um, I haven't spoken to the orchestra again since, uh, but that might start up again as well. Uh, it would have to probably end of next year would be the soonest. Yeah. Big green thumb up, Shane. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Okay, next, uh, kind of going in order as we went through first about some pots issues. Uh, Diane says, I have, I have jade plants that never seem to root firmly. They're always tippy in their pots, even after months. Is it the soil? Is it the pots? What might be going on? Um, I'm going to say, is it getting enough energy from the light to produce roots? Um, that's, that's, that's what I would uh, ask. Um, and, and, and is it over potted? Because right. people think that big jade needs a, a big a big pot. Um, and you know what, jades actually do really nice outside in the summer um, on on your patio. Um, so that's also really nice. It's one of the, it's one of the house plants that actually does really nice outside. Yeah, great. Uh, okay, um, Stacy is asking: Is there a standard rule of thumb about repotting a particular indoor plant, or is it specific to that plant? Uh, for instance, when is the best time to repot Christmas cactus and other cactus plants? Um, so I, I, I answered this question a little earlier about, about you, know, plant, you know, gardening is a lifestyle, so, so do it when, when, when you like. But it, my, my recommendation is, is, is always at the beginning of when, you're, we're, when, we, when we get more light, okay, that's always the best time that a plant can, be, can go through that kind of stress. Um, so I would not recommend repotting in December. I would recommend repotting, um, you know, March, you know, through, through June or July. And um, but I, yeah, but, but again, if it needs to get repotted and you need to do it, it, by all means do it. Yeah. And Christmas cactus is one of those that blooms better and um, more crowded in the pot. It is a, uh, it's an epiphyte. It, it lives in the crotches of, uh, imagine this plant growing in the crotch of a tree 60 feet above ground um, and, and it's only got whatever stuff falls into that crotch and yet it grows to be huge Big. and to be 50 years yeah. old. Um, so they, they don't need to be repotted. We had a neighbor that had a Christmas cactus that was so big you couldn't reach in to get the pot to move it in and out. She moved it in and out of the house and it bloomed wonderfully every year and she wanted to repot it. I just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Most, I would say most, most fails come from either um, overpotting or overwatering. Uh, mo mostly overwatering, but secondly, it's over, you know, overpotting. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. if it's a new plant from the nursery, do not, um, do not rush to repot it within the first year. It's just, it, it's not necessary. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, especially indoors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Peggy is saying that she has a 14-year-old gloxinia. It dies back every fall, comes back gloriously every spring. Dare I repot it? She says it sits too low in the pot at this point, or should I leave it be? I would say with the gloxinia, uh, because they do go dormant. My sister Peggy has one. She says, look, it just, she just loves it because it does keep coming back. Um, you could repot it while it was dormant, but don't go watering it. or it um, Just set it uh, into a pot where you've put some soil in on, or even take it out of the same pot that it's in, put some new soil underneath it, but don't make that soil moist just mm -hmm. to raise it back up. But you could do it while it's dormant. And then sort of along those lines, Judith is curious if uh, there is a favorite planting medium for indoor plants, any particular recommendations for, for medium? So I, I recommend um, bagged potting mix specifically that, are, that is advertised for, uh, for an indoor plant. Um, and that's mostly because it's going to be a sterilized growing media. Um, so you're not introducing things that could have been outside into your home. Um, so, so that would be first and foremost, this is related to the cleanliness aspect. If you're taking um, out, you know, or potting mix that was outdoors or exposed to the, you know, to the, to the world around you, um, there could be eggs inside of it. There could be all sorts of things that you just don't want to introduce inside because, um, our homes are artificial environments for plants. There is not an ecosystem to eat those eggs. <laughs> right. There's not the ecosystem does not exist. So by introducing anything, um, you're 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 asking for problems that way. So I so I, I would always go with a, a sealed bag that is um, 
that is advertised for for in your mix. Do you uh, are, and these are the peat based products that peat and, and maybe some perlite in there? Sure, they're they're they have. Um, there's different formulas. Um, some of them will be advertised for uh, different types of plants. Sure. Um, and, and so I would not go with um, a, a vegetable growing mix at all because that's gonna have too much um, organic content to it. So I, I, would, I would stick to what would be an indoor potting mix. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, great. And then, all right, I've got, got, got to move on. We're, we're on now to light water and location. Um, more questions are coming in though. So Janet, just as a heads up, this might be one of those chat transcripts kind of, uh, kind of weeks. Sure. All right, so for light water and location, Stacy has a, a pretty good question. How do you measure the light in the room? It may seem like you have a lot of light, but maybe enough for a plant. So how do, how do we determine the amount of light um, so one of the easiest ways to determine the light is if you can see your shadow. That's, that's a great exactly, tip. <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. If you can see your shadow and you'll find that you can see your shadow next to the window, but you step a foot away and you can't see a shadow anymore. Um, so you do have to move around to find those places. And, and you can and similar to outdoor, it would be determining the amount of time you see your shadow during the day, right? Yeah. No, how no. much during the day, right. number of hours. For outdoor, for outdoor plants, number of hours makes a, makes a huge difference. And inside, you can make differences. It, um, you, can, you can change the type of light that you have, but you can also do things like bounce more light around with whiter backgrounds, um, even reflective backgrounds for things to, to add more light or light a portion of a plant that wasn't lit otherwise. Yeah. And, oh, sorry, were you, go ahead, go ahead Shane. Oh, sure. I mean, there's, there's, um, I, I, like I said, light is the most important aspect to, to keep your plants um, thriving and, and, and doing well. Um, so there's two other aspects that you need to consider, and that is the, the distance um, that the plant is from the light source, whether it is a window or if it is a artificial light of some kind. Um, and then the other part that I would say is take a look at what's outside your window too. Um, you're, you're typically, you know, if, if you have a lot of shade <laughs> Uh, that's shading your window. Um, it's still getting light, but it's still, but it's also going to get maybe less light than what you think. So um, here in Michigan, um, it's very rare that we ever have a situation to where I would say that there's too much light for for a house plant, just because we're in Michigan here and we're we're uh, you know it's not like we're in you know California or Mexico. So um, you know the, the the best the more light the better typically. Yeah. Great. Um, and then do you have particular recommendations for artificial light sources? Just uh, any, any tips there? Um, so there's bulbs that are marketed um, for, for uh, what we call um, full spectrum. Um, so this is typically a mixture of, um, of light that produces a white light. That's what we like for sustaining green foliage typically. Um, when you see the purple lights uh, that are typically used for uh, growing, I would, you know, more, more commonly nowadays, marijuana or whatever, um, for your common house plant, that is not necessary, okay? Because that, that's, that's giving different, that's giving the light that would need to, do re, to reproduce. And so for most foliage plants, we're talking about plants that are there for our enjoyment, um, a, the white light is, is fine. And the whole idea of fluorescent is that it's a bright light without heat. And that's the, that's the important thing for the, the plants. You, you could get as much light from some incandescent or other types of bulbs, but you'd burn the plant by putting it close enough to get enough yes. from the plant. And watch out yeah. for halogen. Um, halogens can, can, burn, can burn foliage as well. Yeah. We also have a couple of questions about uh, uh, terrariums um, that if succulents, for instance, aren't good in low light, what might you recommend for a terrarium? Uh, this is both Linda and Stacy are interested here. Uh, well, the terrarium so, doesn't have a light fitted across the top of it. It's, it's just a, uh, an unlit terrarium. Uh, let's go with yes on that and presume that if you have a light fitted on the top, then you have more options. <laughs> right. Yes, unlit, Linda says, unlit. What, what goes into a terrarium? Really, so really uh, I, I, I've seen uh, in market as, as fairy garden or fairy plants. So, so these are uh, like mosses and things I've seen people put into. Right. Mosses and ferns, really. And, and, and terrariums, yeah. Yeah, okay. Great. It can be a lot uh, of fun. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know there's a lot of the popular little bromeliads in glass bowls kind of thing that uh, that you you hang with some, some Spanish moss that, that seems like they're in every shop right now. Um, okay, Sue has a question about airflow. Um, just she's brought my 30 plants inside and they're pretty crowded on the shelves. How important is the airflow? And maybe I'll add the sub question of what can you do to better that airflow besides wow. getting a bigger house? Wow, airflow is really important. Leaves, leaves need air just as much as they need anything else. And pests love close, non-moving air areas. Um, we fit, uh, how, how many times I can remember un unwrapping someone's uh, pothos vine 30 times. Are you there, Molly, this morning? How many times did I have to unwrap that? Because people won't cut things back. Um, you got to cut and thin plants out once in a while in order to let the air move around a bit. Yeah, if it looks like a third grade science experiment, um, you're going to want to get a fresh set of eyes on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Pat, the, the, the Pat's asking, I'll have to research that, or maybe Shane knows um, whether the full spectrum lights work through a milky globe cover. I, I think that's probably the same thing as some of the, the uh, high R rating windows cutting down more light. I bet the more that you put a, 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 a piece of glass between your, your grow light and your plant, the more you're cutting down the light. What, what do you think, Shane? So, um, so, so, so the way that uh, like uh, opaque windows work is it, it, it fractures the light. So that, that can actually be quite helpful in terms of providing an even amount of light. Um, so that the hard part is, is that with artificial light, you're already dealing with less um, transmission overall. So anything that you place in front of it that would reduce transmission that will reduce um, the amount of light that, that the plant gets. Um, so, um, I, I presume that that the that the opaque uh, case over it is for aesthetic purposes. Um, I, I would encourage you to continue to think about, you know, how you can keep it pretty, uh, but you might want to add an additional light um, if you feel as though your plants aren't getting enough light, and you know, with that um, globe on it. Yeah. What about rotating the plants too? Um, do you ever do you ever have any situations like that, Shane, where you can rotate a plant for you know ten days. It's in a dark place, and then move it into a lighter place. Does that work? Yes, it does. Absolutely, it does. Um, obviously, it takes some discipline to do that, but um, that is one of the techniques that we use in our trade. Uh, that's the reason why you see palm trees in dark hotel parlors um, because we <laughs> we don't keep them there twelve months out of the year. Otherwise, they die. Yeah. Awesome. Must be interesting to move some of those big things around. I mean, because those it, are big plants. It, it's a lot of labor, um, and and so it's uh, it it is a challenge to do. But you know, thankfully, we have a facility to to recoup plants too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Michelle's got a question. I think a lot of people have about: Do the LED light bulbs still give off enough correct light? I have so. One wondered about that, but I have okay. not into it. So, so, so with all bulbs and, and all light, um, you, you, you want to look at a few things. So one is what kind of spectrum um, is, it, is it giving off? Um, and then what is the, 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 the amount of light? So quite often, so now we, we have like these, uh, you know, these, these vegetable kits where they have LED lights on it and, and it grows the vegetables underneath or whatever. Well, well, that's fine when the lights are like right on top of the plant. But if you put them 10 feet up above there, the plant's not going to get enough light there. Um, so it really depends on, um, on what it is because the technology keeps on changing and it's gotten a lot better. So there are LED lights that, do, that can provide adequate light. Um, it's just reading through the details on it. Um, and also understanding what you're trying to grow. Again, if, you, if you're trying to grow a fruit or a flower, that's very different than just trying to sustain green foliage. Okay. Great. Um, all right. We, uh, how, how are we doing on time, Janet? What are we're, we looking we're like doing, for webinar? We're doing okay on time. Um, we can probably move forward a little bit in, in order to, uh, to, to let people know that we, are, we did cover the notes that we gave them. <laughs> and, and Shane, if you'd like to stay with us, um, sure. please, please do. Because yeah, uh, we, we do still have quite a lot of questions about pests and then my, my miscellaneous section. So maybe we'll get back to, uh, back to those uh, 
next later? Yes, yeah, we'll make sure that we'll make sure that when we get to troubleshooting that we point out where all of these things that people can look at are. Cleaning the leaves of these little succulents is tough to do. Um, when it comes to light, um, if, if you've got a plant that you don't know how much light it needs for sure, take a look at where it grew, where it came from. Yeah, um, do some research on it. Here in Plantera's greenhouse, you're looking at ivy down on the bottom. Look how dark it is underneath those plants. Even in a fully lit greenhouse, it's dark down there. You need forest floor plants in some places, and you're not going to be able to grow something that, that is native to meadows. And that information is available. Um, I find that if I put in the scientific name of the plant, so I don't put in um, fiddle leaf fig. I think those are fiddle leaf figs, uh, a type of ficus. I put in ficus and whichever type it is that I'm looking at, I put in ficus and native region or native area. And it, it will come up. Um, there are plants for a future, the USDA, they keep these informations and they can show mm -hmm. you the native ranges of the plants and let you know where they grow. Um, We've got the list of good low light plants that include the aspidistra that Shane was talking about, and uh, it doesn't include the ZZ plant, but it should. Uh, that's one of the things you'd use the reference links for. A mm -hmm. lot of those lists are there. Um, this is a, uh, uh, an aglaonema, also called um, Chinese evergreen, I think. And it's got some varieties that are uh, have colorful leaves on them and, and works pretty well mm -hmm. in low light. And so does the spider plant uh, and the pothos that vining plant that people have that they've had for 40 years and their grandma had it and then pothos. Yeah. Which, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Sorry, you can't see it, but we can. Um, and they look so much alike, pothos and philodendrons. It's good that they both do well in low light, um, but they're beautiful plants for low light. I, I'd like to add when, you, uh, when there's variegation um, or uh, a line color, um, those plants do require more light than the darker green. To keep that and, color, yeah. Yes, and and so if they don't get enough light, they actually will change to darker green. Yeah, and that's uh, that's all part of that uh, ins and outs of plants, you guys. These, these are chemicals. You're actually looking at a at a transparent surface on that leaf. The color that you see are chemicals that are produced. Those chemicals only get produced with certain le levels of energy. Monstera, remember the Christmas the, the Halloween party where I dressed as a monstera vine? Mm -hmm. That was good. Uh, nice to have a hardware person who can help you do that. Um, but low light plants are good things to have. Um, if you look at the leaf type, you can sometimes tell which goes somewhere. These are both Kalanchoes, um, which most people say is Kalencho, but Kalanchoe is technically right. better. Um, they're both Kalanchoes, but notice that this one has fuzzy leaves and fuzz and hair on a leaf usually means that it's trying to prevent water loss because it comes from a dry, arid area. Um, and so the, the water requirements are going to be different on a plant based on what their leaves are like. So if you don't look it up, you might be able to tell by gardener's intuition. The apophytes, the air plants that I suddenly said they're everywhere anymore, they might look a little bit like an aloe. But if you rub your hand on that leaf, you're mm. going to find that there's fuzz on the leaf because they're used to taking the humidity from around them and keeping that moisture on their leaf, whereas an aloe, the leaf is very smooth, very slick. It keeps its water moisture inside. Uh, so tips on light, rotate plants, turn them, and wash your windows. Wash the windows. Wash your windows. <laughs> Those of you in New York City, Antoinette, <coughs> uh, V, wash the windows. It'll make a big difference to how those plants do. Um, so that gets us to the questions that would be the pretty pictures I was looking for. But we're going to go forward because we we took we talked about water already, and we want to talk a little bit more about water before we get into a question session. Um, it's hard to figure out water. Shane, people have such a problem with water that I, I find that it kills more plants than most anything else in people's houses is overwatering it or watering it the wrong way. Yes, I, I I think it's because plant people are just generally very nurturing. Um, <laughs> And, and the other part is that when, when you take a gardener that gardens outside, uh, we're always thinking about water. <laughs> right, right, right. Because water yeah. is the thing that's always missing outside. Whereas, like you say, with the jade or the sedum here on the left, um, it's storing water. Uh, 
you almost need to look at the leaves and see when it starts using up its water before you know whether it needs water, as opposed to things with, with smoother leaves that the roots are bringing in all the water. Yeah, uh, the, other, the other thing I would recommend to monitor water is uh, a soil probe. And those work very, soil probes work very well in potting mixes, you guys. They don't work so well outside. outside no. People say that it doesn't work well. It's not meant, it wasn't set up for the kind of consistency of soils outside. But those probes work to tell you whether or not it's, it's moist in there. Uh, and, uh, and when you look at a plant and see the fuzz on the leaf of the African violet, you're, you're looking at a plant that's not going to like it if you leave water sitting on its leaves. Which a lot of people water their African violet from the top. Yeah, and they, they shouldn't, they should water it by setting it in into some water um, versus things like the fern, which might be a Dallas, no, I don't think it's a Dallas fern, one of these ferns remember. here. You can see the brown on the tips of the leaves. This is a plant that likes high humidity and a constant moisture, unlike a, a jade or the succulents that the potting mix should dry down before you start watering it again. Not well, the, dry out. The other tool that I would recommend to help with watering um, is the use of sub irrigation. Uh, we use this in commercial all the time, uh, but there is uh, there are um, systems available retail to, for the general public, um, such as Lechuza, um, that actually has a, a reservoir in the bottom of the, of the pot, uh, which with a fill tube, and that allows the plant to um, to, to absorb the water underneath. We do have pictures of the system that uh, the chain uses the, of these self-watering sub-irrigation pots to use. Um, so uh, this is this is one that's not a so, sub Yeah, not that's sub not sub. This, this that not photograph sub is, is not sub-irrigation, but it's just showing on how we use vinyl liners inside decorative pots uh, to prevent damage to your floor. <laughs> to, to your floor and, and also, to your surface. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, and it does make it a little bit better for the plant because those plant those. Yes. Uh, glazed pots don't breathe at all, and the water gets quite mildewy in there. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit later. We've got a set to show you how the sub-irrigation works, so we'll get to that. Um, I think most people seem to, to get a little bit off on how much water and how often um, they say, well, I water every week. Um, if the light is lower, the plant doesn't use as much water. If the number of leaves is less, it doesn't use as much water. Yeah. Um, so it needs to be more of a, a feel for it, how heavy the pot is, whether the leaves are getting dry. Um, these were jades that we put outside every year at a client's place because yeah. not much else would grow there. And like Shane said, they, they perform very well outside. No irrigation, outdoor, yeah. It, it, during the summer. Yeah. So they're the leaves are telling you when they need to be watered. And uh, another thing that people don't seem to recognize is that, for instance, if you cut all the leaves of the palm here, because maybe the tips were brown or because you like this look better, um, from one day to the next, this plant is not losing, it's not transpiring as much water because it has less yes. leaf surface. You it. So you, you need to pay attention to what the soil is telling you and how whether it feels cool or not, and whether the plant is one that wants to dry down or stay all the time moist. And, and so in, in this time of year, there's some counterintuitive things that occur. Um, one is, is that if, you're, if your plant is near a heat register and it dries out the soil more frequently, um, you could be battling um, you know, evaporation through, from the dryness uh, more so than the plant actually using the water. Um, so that's the, other, that's the other aspect to monitor um, with your indoor plants is how things change as the seasons go inside the environment of, of your space. Yeah, literally, they're not they're not um, photosynthesizing enough to pull enough water up to keep them moist. Yeah, and that's when you have to start misting things or putting a tray full of pebbles mm -hmm. underneath. Um, one of uh, Plantera's uh, early on technicians, Jane Sale, taught yes. classes at our school, and Jane Jane taught our our people. She said, "Take measure your water, pour it in until it comes out of the bottom." Let it come out of the bottom into the catch tray and let the plant sit for 15 or 20 minutes to reabsorb some water that it might reabsorb and then pay attention to how much water you it, put it in. Didn't use. If that plant took a quarter, if, if that plant took a quarter cup of water in that little tiny pot, or if your plant took a half a gallon of water, that's how much water you're going to be putting in when you water. And it's not going to matter 
uh, it, the amount isn't going to vary. It's the frequency that's going to vary, vary, but the plant's going to use it at a different rate. Um, yep. And uh, so I'm watering some of those things from the bottom and letting them soak up water for about 20 minutes before I decide whether they've taken up, how much water they've taken up. Um, okay, but don't assume that the self-watering, like, like Shane says, watch them to see whether or not maybe there's something else going on. Here's the reservoir on the bottom. And I'll, Shane, I'll let you, I'll, let, I'll flip through these pictures just so you see what's coming up, Shane. And then, sure. talk, so, and then you can yeah. tell people what's there. Yeah, so it so it, it, in the in the trade, the way that we um, are able to extend um, the amount of time for servicing is to use what we call sub irrigated pots, and so this is available commercially, but on a retail level, there's a there's a system that is German called Lechuza, and there's others too. If you go to your retail garden center and ask about sub irrigation, I mean, what it is, it's a sealed chamber, um, which is great because it can sit inside a decorative container of your choosing. And then the bottom has the reservoir where the roots then are trained to then soak up water from below. Um, and then there's a fill tube. And then the fill tube has a monitor on it that will tell you when the reservoir is completely full. Um, so this is a, it's a, it's a very easy way um, to ensure that your plants are getting enough water and not too much. And as you can see here, we have lots of drainage. So there's uh, there is a reservoir plus there's a drain, there, there is a, that we have pebbles in the bottom. These pebbles are called um, lica or expanded clay. And what they do is they actually hold moisture, um, but they're gonna prevent the plant from having wet feet. So they're kind of like um, little sponges made out of stone. Um, and it's a, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great invention, very similar to what lava rock would do naturally. Great. And so you're taking this, this plant out of a pot that's, uh, that, that it was produced in and you're putting it into one of your sub-irrigated pots here? Correct. And so the big difference is, is that our nursery pot has holes in the bottom. The sub-irrigated pot does not. Um, so it is, it is a closed system. But the way that we prevent the pot from becoming soup or whatever is, is, the, is the fill tube monitor. Um, otherwise, it is, it is very difficult to now to water. Now, this image here, you see the water on top. It has to be activated, so the soil has to be wet. Um, and then after the plant is wetted and the roots grow, that's when the sub irrigation really starts to work. So um, that's so, the monitor, the little tube that's popped up there is saying water. Correct. Be yep, that is correct. And then you just fill the tube. Mm -hmm. And the monitor goes away. It says, okay, I'm fine now for a while. Well, right? it goes up. Tells yeah. you it's full, then when yep. it's not there, it's... Yeah. I, I made something like this for a client that was killing a peace lily by overwatering it in a pot that had no drainage at all. And we, I made a reservoir and, and I, I put a pipe down the side and gave her a long stick with a cotton swab. I said, you put the stick down there and if the swab comes up moist, do not water that plant. <laughs> Yes, and, and there are, there's lots of resources out there to, to make this on your own, um, just like how you did, you know, for that piece, Lily. Um, it, it's a very simple concept, but it's, it's proven to be very effective, and it's, it's worked for us for decades. Yeah. Great. Decades. That's great. Um, it's more common to overwater something. So here's, this is not the piece, Lily, I was just referencing. It wasn't quite as bad as this, but when the, the leaves the leaves are, are dying. They're not turning yellow gradually and falling as a plant would do. People notice this with ficus, for instance, that they take them from outside or from one place in the house to another and they drop leaves. They're usually dropping leaves to adjust to a lower level of light. This one is just plain dying. And uh, those are not its roots. I couldn't find a picture of its roots. It's a different plant with uh, a root problem, but that's root rot. We all know what a good vegetable looks like in the crisper drawer. If I take a plant out of its pot and its root tips are rotted, like you see there. Brown, black. Brown, and even those that are still white have, you can see that they're Issues. turning dark. Um, that's because somebody's been watering it too much. And, and uh, did we give Grandma Jenny silk plants or did we just talk about giving we her talked silk about plants? It because because she, she had to water every, every day. day. <laughs> she, she watered and killed everything. Um, Okay, so, and, and don't overpot too soon. So here's a clivea. You might be able to see the bulge in the side of the pot. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they like to be crowded. They want to bloom better when they're crowded, but if you need a piece of it, go for it. And we already talked about the jade being, uh, it's not too crowded. It doesn't need to be over, uh, over potting. If you do have to move it to the next size pot, move it to the next size pot. Just maybe an inch of new soil around the outside and underneath, but not. It doesn't need much. Don't put it into something huge. I've been wondering about these palms, uh, Shane, for years, going to places where palms grow outside and wondering why sometimes there is a gap between these, the ends of the, uh, the fronds that were cut off. Sometimes there'll be a neck, like it grew without any leaves for a while. Does that ever happen to these? Um, so, so, so for this particular plant, this is a, uh, th- this is a cycad, it's a sago palm. Um, and so the trunk that you see comes from the crown growing over time. So each layer of the crown uh, represents um, a layer of, of leaves up on top um, that have gone through its cycle. Um, and in, in Michigan, because we don't have a whole lot of light in its native habitat, they require a ton of light. Um, they're very slow growing indoors, even our, in our greenhouse. So this particular plant is over 50 years old. I'd say probably about 60 years old. Wow, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so, so now we've got a chance before, but, but you tell me, Sonia, that a lot of the questions are about pests. Uh, yeah, we do have a few more on watering. Should we go ahead and, and grab those? Yes, or do you wanna move on? Let's, yeah. let's grab the watering okay. questions before we go to the pest questions. Yeah, excellent. So just to clarify, Margaret's asking, um, should you not use water direct from the faucet? Um, and Stacy was asking about softened water. I think I felt pretty confident saying, yes, don't use softened water, but what about just tap water? How, what, what's, the, what's the status there for watering your plants? Um, I'll, I'll answer a, a few things that come into play. Um, so, so the two things with, with tap water that could become an issue is one is temperature, okay? So if, so if the plant gets shocked with super, super cold water, um, that, can, that can cause some damage. And then the, the other part is, is when fluoride um, is, is introduced by the, by the municipality water systems, it is not always even. Um, certain times of the year, there's more that's added than others. So the easiest way to, um, to, kind of, to reduce those things is to fill up your water bucket um, and then just let it sit. <laughs> Let it get to room temperature. You can even pre-fill them up, leave them fill for, for a day or two uh, before you water it. And, and if there's fluoride in it, a lot of that, from what I understand, I'm not a chemist, for some reason it, it, it evaporates out. Is, right, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's in gas form then, and it does, it does uh, bubble out. Uh, um, we, we looked at that, the cold temperature thing, and, and don't worry too much about just from the tap cold, but cold, cold, um, not a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we use our, our dog water bowl. We have uh, two big dogs and a big water bowl, and there's always some left when, uh, when we're changing it. And we often use that then for watering, uh, which is also nice to reduce the, the water use. So uh, Michelle also said that she keeps a wine bottle out uh, that, um, uh, so that the chlorine can dissipate. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, water sitting out. Uh, Donna saying using water from the dehumidifier, uh, would that also make sense? Someone asked me that once before, and I think I talked to a, uh, a water treatment guy, to, and Terry said that that which should actually be pretty close to the same as using your tap water, although he wouldn't drink it. He said, well, it, you know, it's not going to be softened, so if you're looking for not, not introducing salts, that's one way to do it, but it would depend a lot on what exactly, what type of uh, dehumidifier you had, what might be floating around in your air, so... He said it's yeah. kind of hard to pin that one down to across the board answer. Yeah. Uh, distilled water? Yes, no. Sure, distilled water would, would be uh, would be not softened water. Uh, it's kind of expensive way to well, yeah. Way. <laughs> yeah. At, yeah. At Plantera, we irrigate all of our plants with recycled rainwater. Yeah. So there you go, Stacy was just asking that. That worked works nicely. Yep. Um, and so um, we have, we have a, a 16,000 gallon cistern um, that stores our roof runoff water and that's what we use to water our plants. Wow, great. Gotcha. Yeah, um, so uh, Shelly is saying this, the house she's in has high light uh, and a bad indoor, I mean, she's a bad indoor water or there is a bad indoor water in the house. 
any recommendations? The plants from my previous low light home, Ivy, don't do well here. So she needs recommendations for high light, but that might be able to handle watering that isn't isn't up to snuff. Is that <laughs> it? I, I think I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what would that be? Well, succulents are would be a great choice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I think I think the uh, I think the spider plant ought to work really well. And there's there are varieties of, of spider plant highlight. Um, of course, mother-in-law's tongue. I like mother-in-law's tongue, but uh, a lot of people don't. That can handle a lot of anything. Um, boy, it's hard because if you, if you don't, if the watering isn't right, anything yeah. can be in trouble. So I think the answer is uh, train train the water. <laughs> Focus on that. Be trained. Yep. yep. Um, okay. Let's. Uh, I think that'll probably do for watering for now. Let's let's move on so we can get more to uh, to pests. Okay. So we're we we need to break the video into smaller pieces. So we're going to take a pause for a moment here. We finish light and water. We're going to move on to the air and troubleshooting. You're listening to We Can Walk About, and if you want to keep going, then cue up the next section on the recording or bear with us right now. <laughs> 